Yeah, so it's great to see everybody here, and it's nice to be in Portland where I live, and I love the city, so it's, I'm glad you guys get to uh, experience it. Uh, this talk, how I envision this talk is giving some insights from real engineers uh, in a production systems that Safari Books Online has deployed uh, about various REST, uh, our use of various web services libraries to build Django APIs. And it's sort of an evolution because, you know, this, we started kind of with one thing and then we tried something else, now we're doing this other thing. And it's changed over time and we have a variety of libraries uh, in production right now. So we'll kind of talk through, you know, three or, three or four of these things. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is give you some real words from, from different engineers, um, not just me and not, not necessarily like Safari's position, but um, what we've experienced, like the good things and, and some of the bad. But at first I have a question. Uh, are any of you creators or authors of a Django web services library? Okay, good, good. So, so tone down the, the, the stress a little bit. But, uh, so we will be talking about some cons, and it's not a, not a judgment necessarily. All right, so quick introductions uh, before I get into it. So a little bit about you, who I think you might be for this talk. You're familiar with Django and REST. Um, you want to hear about some real-world uses of Django, like I just described, uh, Django Web Services Libraries to write APIs. And quickly about me at Safari, I'm a senior software engineer. Uh, I write front end code and I write some back end code and mostly back end right now. Uh, I also like to write text editor plugins for some reason. I don't know what it is for different editors. Um, so there you go. Uh, and a little bit about Safari since they sent me here and I got to use this uh, nice uh, PowerPoint template to make this presentation. Uh, you know, sort of. You might know us by the the longer form Safari Books Online. Uh, we're kind of throwing around Safari now. It's a little shorter, and just sort of our catchphrase. You know, is we're we're bringing the best uh, books and courses to life. So we want to give you guys access to videos, books, whatever it is you need to learn. Um, come come and and look at our site and, and learn. Uh, but a spoiler alert: if you need to jump out, I want you to leave with something from this talk. Um, so I will tell you the end of the talk before we do the entire talk. Uh, and that is that we use Django REST framework for our new APIs. And we'll get into some reasons why. There's, some, there's a long list of, of things we like about it. Uh, but if you need to leave with something, and I'm sure you've already heard this many times, this probably isn't new, but Django REST framework is, is good. Uh, so let's start at the beginning, right? And this is in some ways like the beginning, maybe it's the beginning of your prototype. We can also look at it as before we did, before we used a library for doing our web services, we used some plain views and I've also used some prototypes as well as I mentioned. So let's look at some pros of using just vanilla Django views for your API. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, as you may know or may not know, they're good for returning like snippets of rendered HTML from a template. Um, or something really simple like you want to just expose a read-only API for some JSON or XML data. So all good. Uh, they give you complete control over the structure and output of your, your, uh, your data, and you can do whatever you want in your view function or class-based view to get this done. Um, and a little helper I find nice if I'm doing a prototype and I want to use vanilla Django views is JSON view. The, it's, uh, it's actually called Django JSON View, and basically gives you this little decorator you put on top of your view, and uh, it, it helps manage like the serializing, deserializing, the Python data structures to JSON. Um, it's just like handy, you know, cut down some of that boilerplate. But of course, there are some cons, like why would we have all these library frameworks if there weren't some nasty things about using vanilla views? Um, you wind up with a lot of boilerplate, I'm sure, if you've written if you've done this, you know, you know, you, you wind up with a lot of stuff. A lot of it is around validating input data for over the line. It's a lot about um, setting up the deserialization and deserialization for multiple content types and so forth. Um, having total control can lead to inconsistency of your responses across and within projects. So maybe you have multiple apps that have APIs. Um, you might have developers doing stuff differently in different apps and suddenly, you know, 
the errors you get back when there's an error are slightly a diff different structure, and the clients have to code differently. Blah blah blah. You know, it's, it's just not that fun. Um, and you might end up with multiple views. Well, you will end up with multiple views for different content types uh, that help manage. You know, oh, I want my stuff back in XML or JSON. Uh, it's not so easy if it's plain Django view. You might have to do some extra stuff. All right. You probably already know all this. Um, I want to look at Piston mostly because it's what we used, I think, as our first real like web services library. Probably everybody knows. You know, Piston isn't the greatest choice at this point. Um, not to malign Piston, but we'll talk about it because this is a history, this is an evolution, uh, and, and so we'll talk about pros of Piston. There's probably more than this. This is not very nice, right? But the major pro, if you were to delete, use it today, is you can get a, a simple API up and running. Probably any library can do that, but um, there you go. I had a lot of cons, so keep this short. So we ran some problems with Piston. Uh, number one problem, of course, if you've used Piston, it's really not being maintained. It's kind of a dead library at this point. Um, the last release was on PyPy was in like 2011. So uh, you know, we we perceive that the community is drying up. We still have APIs that were written in Piston, but we're probably going to migrate them over to Django REST framework. Um, and I think we have migrated some over to TastyPy, and we might wind up migrating those to DRF as well. Uh, so real problems like. One of the real problems we had is there's not an explicit serializer really for your uh, your API classes, so it kind of makes it you know it's a little bit sticky to manage the uh, or to mangle the output of the data. So if I want to add in some you know dynamically calculated field in my in my JSON that I'm returning, uh, a lot of that logic winds up inside of this one monolithic API class, uh, and that's just it's it doesn't it, it's not good for maintainability, you know. This is a problem that actually is in a lot of different libraries, um, but Piston is one where we found it the first time. Uh, and there's no pagination out of the box. So Piston didn't ship with uh, the ability to paginate results set, your result set in, in the API. Turns out that's pretty useful if you are turning lots of, lots of items in a list. Um, and there's more, right? There's other ones, but why should we really spend a lot of time on Piston at this point? Um, I think Piston was a great library when I first started using it. I was like, "Dang, this is way better than writing vanilla views." You know, this is awesome, and it paved the way. So, props to Piston. Uh, the next thing we settled on was TastyPy. So, what are some pros of, of TastyPy? People are still thinking, "Well, do I use TastyPy? Do I use DRF?" At this point, um, so what can TastyPy give you? What did it give us? Uh, it gave us pagination out of the box, which was awesome. Uh, and then, so it was a little bit, a little bit better, right? There was, uh, there was a couple improvements over Piston. One of them was uh, it was easier to mig to, to uh, change the output data we were sending back because TastyPy has this thing, these these methods you can override um, for hydrating and dehydrating, which is another, you know, it's just another for serializing, deserializing your data structures. So that was nice. Um, it was an improvement. And we found the resource object that you subclass to be relatively straightforward in terms of uh, its APIs, you know, interacting with it. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but on the surface, uh, pretty straightforward. And then one of the cool things about TastyPy, which is still cool, is that uh, it will generate a schema based on your API automatically. So if you have a client that can do something with that schema, uh, which is sort of a big if, but if you have one, then that's pretty helpful to do client-side validation. Then you're also going to do your server-side validation as well. Um, and it handles setting up the URLs for you, which is kind of a double-edged sword, right? It's like, that's nice. It, it's fast. Uh, it is not necessarily Pythonic, just an automatic URL thing, um, in my opinion, because you know, I kind of like having you know, my URLs pretty explicit. But a lot of frameworks um, do that for you. you know, uh, Rails does it as well. Um, and these other libraries, like Django REST framework, have a, have a router. Anyway, pro. so a couple cons. We kind of ran into some big problems using TastyPy, and they weren't really things we expected. Uh, at Safari, a lot of our backend APIs are like, uh, it's like a pipeline of content, right? So we get a bunch of stuff from publishers. We get lots of material from them. 
A lot of it is like EPUBs and PDFs. Some of these files are pretty large, even when you chunk them. And Tasty Pie didn't handle like binary types very well. Um, there's an open issue I linked to. I didn't want to just be like, oh, this didn't work that well. So I, I put a link in here if you can if you get access to the PDF version or not, you can check it out. Um, and then I think this is more like um, we end up having to do some custom stuff, yada, 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 to get, it, to get a file upload working against the API. Um, if you read that issue, you know, there's like, oh, I got this fork, and you can use it, you know. So one of the problems we ran into was like high memory usage uh, on a receiving a file upload because it wasn't doing any kind of streaming. It would just buffer the entire thing into memory, and they we were uploading huge objects um, a lot of times. So another thing was that we ran into was uh, it, it turned out to be while the resource object was easy to use, it turned out that it was not so easy to extend lots of parts of Tasty Pie, in our, in our opinion. And again, this is multiple engineers giving me feedback on this, so it's not like we all had the same problems, but this was a perceived difficulty. Um, and the same with Piston is, and this I've seen this too, is you generally end up with a single API class that's kind of responsible for doing everything. Like it does the, it handles all the custom serialization, deserialization logic, and a bunch of other, you know, fields that control like authentication and stuff. So that is what it is, you know, but it's, it's generally a lot of code in one place responsible for a lot of different things, which has a smell about it uh, when you have to maintain it. Uh, and uh, uh, one, of, one of the engineers told me that Tasty Pie had too much magic, um, which you can take with a grain of salt because actually this, this person uh, used a lot of generator expressions, which if you've had to maintain are interesting to, uh, to debug sometimes. Um, so another one. This is kind of an interesting point, right? So a big thing about uh, web services libraries is you know, you have all this validation that you need to do. Like, you need to give, like, you want to give the client a schema so the scheme, so the client can do some validation before it uses any requests to send any data over at all. Um, but you also need to do all that same validation, you know, on the server side when you receive data. And uh, Piston, I think, and TastyPy both approach this by using Django's excellent already existing code to do input validation, which is the form, like, the form code, right? So. You would create a form and you check your inbound data against this form schema and this form acts like a schema, right? So you can say, oh, this is, this is not typed correctly, yada, 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 send it back, uh, however you want. But that's kind of weird um, it, for us. Like, we don't really like using forms to validate like JSON data coming in from an API. It's not specialized to that purpose. It's, they're kind of specialized to the purpose of handling like form inputs, right? So one of the things, like, say you want to output the error messages that the form generated from validation because of the validation problems, right? You have to do some funky stuff, like get in there and kind of get the, uh, get the, there's not a clean API to get, like, simple text out of the form error sometimes. Or maybe there is now, but there wasn't. I think there is, actually, in 1.7, but a little bit odd. All right, so we were in these problems. We didn't know what to do. There's so many options. And then uh, we had a new engineer come to us, and we asked him, hey, what do you think about Django REST framework? Like, is it cool? And uh, to my knowledge, he told us that he thought it was cool. And because he's a new engineer, I think we want to really look at his input um, because of new people on the team. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So we took a look at Django REST framework, and turned out uh, it was awesome. It was actually really awesome. So I actually had to break up list of good things about Django Rust Framework into two parts because there were so many things we liked about it, and I didn't really want to leave any of these out. I actually leave out a bunch of stuff out. Um, and I put this one at the top. So the order in these is based on me. It's sort of arbitrary, right? But uh, the number one thing about Django Rust Framework that I really love, that we have found, is how well documented it is. Like, you can go to the site today, you don't need to attend a talk about Django. I mean, you should if you're interested, but you don't need to read anything but the docs to really get up and running, and also, beyond that, to really go deep into understanding how part of, parts of it work. So it's very well done, and the creator uh, is very attentive on Stack Overflow forums, asking questions. It feels good. Um, 
And you know, you are everybody. You know, one of the first things you see about Django REST framework is how's this awesome uh, HTTP REST API browser? You've probably seen this already, right? But Django REST framework it creates this HTML view that you can access as a human being that shows you information about the API. It's awesome. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's really number two on my list, but it's it's something that everybody likes when they first start using it, right? But some real stuff, like what do, what do we what do we really find useful? Um, out of the box pagination and this filtering feature it has were really useful to us as we were upgrading some of our old APIs, and we upgraded a bunch of APIs from TastyPy to Django REST framework, um, and this came in handy. Uh, and as just as an anecdote, not on a, as a bullet point, but as an anecdote, that API, I'm not saying it's TastyPy's fault, but um, there were a lot of pieces of that API that we upgraded that were very poorly performant in, in memory. And you could look in New Relic, we get the alerts, you know, and you're like, oh, God, it's few. It's just crushing the server. Like, so much RAM is being used by this stuff. Uh, and we try to fix it, and, you know, we get somewhere and here and there. That doesn't happen anymore with our Django REST framework uh, version. So it's more complex than, oh, we switched to Django REST framework. We didn't have any problems anymore. Um, we made some changes based on what we learned wasn't working. Uh, but also, I th it's my perception that performance is a little bit better in Django REST framework. Uh, and so back to the bullet points. It, uh, it supports token auth out of the box, uh, which is just nice if you want to get up and running with uh, token auth. Like, yeah, you just drop it in, it's going to start working. But there's more. Uh, there's more. So uh, it is very easy to customize output from your APIs, including resource relationships. So in REST, right, we have the we have this thing called the resource, and they relate to each other. Uh, and it's easy to set that all up and get it the way you want it with URLs or IDs or whatever with these explicit serializer classes. So the thing about Django REST framework is you end up with a bunch of composed objects, right? So you have your thing and it has a serializer, it has a filter class, yada yada. It's not just one big class that does everything. It's composed into pieces that make sense, that are separately testable, reusable in different contexts, uh, and one of those things is a serializer. Okay, and here's a cool thing. So, server-side validation. You're going to have server-side validation in different stages. Um, a lot of people will use validation routines in the model classes uh, to do validation. So, a great thing about Django REST framework is when it's creating something over the API, it will call full clean on your model. So you can stick all your business rule validation into full clean and use it. And Django REST framework will use that. You don't have to abstract it into something else and then that, you know, use that in your API and call it from your full clean or whatever. It's just you can put it where it sort of belongs uh, and it will get used, which is nice. And sort of bouncing around here, but the community itself is very active, very helpful, uh, we have found, uh, which is very, very important, um, obviously. And, you know, more about, like, beauty, right? We perceive it to be elegant, and that's important. This is Python. Um, our perception of beauty in our team is actually, a, you know, a high criteria kind of important thing to us. And looking at the code, but also looking at what we got out of it. You know, what does our API code actually look like? We find it to be elegant, we find it to be extensible, uh, and, and that makes us happy every day. So, plus one. Uh, and sort of related, your API representation is of being pretty concise. And it's, you know, this is, I didn't write this bullet point myself, but you know, what you end up with is, like I said, it's a bunch of composed objects. So. It is concise in the sense that here's this one API. It looks pretty small when I look at the high-level view, right? And then I'm going to go down and I'm going to look at the individual composed classes like the filter or whatever, and, I, and you're going to expand out into multiple classes. But it's nice to be able to see a concise overview sort of at the, at the top level of the object hierarchy. Class hierarchy, we'll say, actually. So. Um, but I am not going to say that it's the best thing on earth. You know, that everything has a couple flaws or whatever. These are flaws. We found some cons. Um, so one thing that we really miss about TastyPy is there's no built-in schema generation. So uh, clients can't auto-discover that stuff. And we have to maintain our own schema, which is pretty common um, when you have an API 
I guess. Uh, but I, I don't really like it. I don't like having to go in and like, oh, I changed the thing in the API. Oh, all right, I got to go in and update the schema file. And yeah, that's fine. We, we have a client that uh, can read the schema and knows what to do with it, our own like, in-house REST client. So that's the thing. Maybe someone will release some package that does this for us someday, and I won't have to do this anymore. <laughs> I hope. Um, then there can still be lots of boilerplate. <laughs> like, so there's an interesting thing about this, right? I'm pretty sure there's a bullet point I either removed or put on every single one of these sections that are bullet boilerplate. Uh, I think that's just programming. Like you actually have to write code uh, with no matter what library you choose, right? So take it with a grain of salt. Um, but exposing filtering mechanisms we found can sometimes be convoluted, and I think there's different things going on here, right? It's Django REST framework gives you this thing that is the ability to filter results in the URL. And it kind of feels to me, it feels a lot like your uh, filter parameter you're going to pass in to the Django ORM, right? But it's not really the same. Um, and there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there, I think. Uh, and you, you, you kind of have to do some stuff to expose these different types of filtering options within your URLs. So it can be a little convoluted. And somebody informed me that uh, model to model fields are read only, which I don't think is going to be a game changer. I think you can, you know, probably by default, yada, yada, you do some overrides and you can, we do set uh, related fields on related objects, but you have to do some, you have to actually write some code, I think. It's terrible. Um, and some of us like the way that routers are implemented. And if you're not familiar with router, a router is, is this thing you can use to, uh, like, say you have um, this API code you wrote for a book, or books, we'll say. It returns information about books, and you can use a router object to, like, automatically generate some URLs for it. Um, I don't really have a problem with it, but, you know, we're, we're a diverse group of folks. I wanted to give the, the voice, honor the voice of the engineer who did not actually like that, how they were implemented. So uh, I'm almost out of time here. I think uh, we'll do a quick summary. So sometimes you can get away with a plain Django view. I often, when I'm prototyping, will use just straight up views. And then uh, if it turns out we're going to do something, like maybe we go back and, and add it. You do it right with a, with a library, um, which I got to stop doing, I think. Like, uh, it's, uh, it might be easier just to start with. The library. The Django REST framework is pretty simple to set up. So. Um, and I want to re-emphasize that I don't think that Piston is bad, um, and even that you know, Tasty Pie was bad. Um, Piston got us rolling. You know, it was this library that I started with like back at, when I worked at Dark Horse for a while doing uh, digital publishing. It was great. You know, it was a good start. Sort of paved the way. Um, Tasty, Tasty Pie was a great improvement over Piston and gave us all these nice features. And you know, everything depends on something else, right? You can't have, you can't get up here without starting here. And all these libraries sort of build on what we learn. Um, Django REST framework, I think, has learned a lot from Tasty Pie. It's learned a lot from Piston and other stuff. I'm not, I can't speak for the author um, to say oh, I know how he how he figured out, you know, how to do this. But I think. We learn, and we are using Django REST Framework for new APIs because we think it's great. So that's the takeaway. Um, I am free after the talk to answer any like questions you might have about any of these points or to uh, or to chat. So thank you very much. <laughs>